Hey guys, welcome back to How to Train Your Gavin. This is my February wrap-up, which I am dreading to film because I have read quite a fair bit. Read those books in a blink, oh yeah. Grab yourself a hot drink, cause you're watching How to Train Your Gavin. Yep, that's me. So, with it being the shortest month of the year, <laughs> with it being the shortest month of the year, I ended up reading 23 books. <laughs> Which is the most I've ever read in one month. Does anybody remember my 2020 goal of reading less? Because I sure as hell don't. Oscar, you know what I mean? Oh, you're so beautiful. I just want to squeeze you. Uh, sorry, anyway. So I read 23 books. Uh, and I will let you know my secret of how I read 23 books, okay? To wrap up what I participated in this month, I did do Polathon for one week from the 3rd to the 9th of February. And I read six books in that one week. So there's six out the gate right there. I also partook in a sort of like Amelia Fang one day challenge where I read like six and a half books. So really I've read 22 and a half books this, this month. But I read, well, technically seven books in the one day for Amelia Fang day that I invented myself. Now we have like 13 books out of the gate in like the one week in the one day. So that's like eight days worth of, of that. And the other 20 days, so like the other three weeks, I read, what's math, hang on, well, what was it, six, add, seven, 13. So I read 10 books in 20 days. So that's not too bad, right? So it, it's actually not as impressive as it sounds when I put it like that. So 17 of the books that I read in February were physical and six of them, yep, yeah, six, were audio books. Listening to the audio books did help as well. So my average rating for January was 7.43. For February, it's 8.01. So we're definitely on the rise, despite me reading a lot more this month. It's gone up from January where I only read 11 books. So my February page total is 7,160 pages. 19 of those books were middle grade, so that also helped quite a bit. Three of them were young adult and one of them was adult. Although actually one of them you could technically count as a middle grade if you wanted to. Some people do, but I will get on to that one when I talk about the book. These are all the books I read in February and I can't get them all in one shot. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, okay, it's gonna slip off or something, but these are all of them. Oh, no, don't, don't fall. Don't fall. And they're like, oh, oh gosh, oh my gosh, this is a nightmare. A nightmare come true, because I've got a coffee literally right there, and if these fall into my coffee, I'm going to be very upset. Oh, okay, I think I've got it, I've got it, I've got it, okay, hallelujah. Not all of these were on my February TBR, though. I think only 10 of these were actually on my TBR, so I read 13 books that weren't on my official February TBR. There were two books that I really wanted to read in February, but I didn't really get round to. One of the books I didn't manage to read in February was Havenfall by Sarah Holland, and I'm gutted because this was a proof and it comes out in March, so I've been trying so hard. One of my 2020 goals was to read proofs before they come out, otherwise what was the point in getting the proofs? But I just wasn't feeling this at all. I don't know why, because it is, it is right up my street. I just didn't want to read it. I just wanted to read things that weren't on my official TBR more. <laughs> Sorry about that. I will probably read this at some point. I, pr I promise I will. And I also didn't get to read my A arc of Witches of Ashen Room by A. Latimer. I've realised that I can't read things on my Kindle anymore. I used to devour them, but now when I try to read, my eyes just don't want to cooperate. It's, I'm really struggling with e-books and it breaks my heart because I used to live on my Kindle until I started reading physically again. And now I'm just, I can't read anything that's not physical or I can't do it if it's not an audiobook kind of thing. Gave up on that one, but it does, that one does come out on March 3rd. So I will get the physical copy and I will read it physically because I need to. I, I loved what I read so far of it. I just, I couldn't have continued on reading it as an ebook. So I'm sorry about that. So now I need to rank them from my least favorite to favorite and a lot of these I have talked about in my Paulathon vlog, in my Amelia Fang vlog, in my Akatar vlog. So I won't give like as detailed reviews on those books I've talked about in those vlogs. I will just link them. Um, but I will give you like brief summaries and my brief thoughts on them as well as my Copile rating. So Copile was a rating system created by Jay at Book Roast and I will link that video down in the description box. As always, I use it every month and I'm obsessed with it. So first I want to sort these out into <laughs> the right order. God, grief. It's the eye of the tiger, it's the thrill of the fight. Shit! 
No boots were harmed. No boots were harmed. I love you, baby. Why are you so distracting for? Why? Oh, yes. Hello, baby. Oh, look who's decided to join. It's Huskies. Oh, doesn't like to be in the camera though, but he wants to be on my lap. Oh, my heart. Oh, he's never sat on my lap before during a video. Oh, he's just so beautiful. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm in the middle of recording. <laughs> uh, but it doesn't matter, because he's the best. Aren't you, baby? In number 23 is the International Yeti Collective by Paul Mason and Katie Riddell. This one has a copy rating of 6.57, which isn't too bad a rating, to be honest. Uh, it just, it's placed bottom of my February list, unfortunately. I read this one for Paulathon, and I talk so much more about this in my vlog, and I don't want to take up too much of my time in this video talking about books I've already talked a lot about. This one does follow a young girl called Ella and she goes with her uncle on this yeti hunting expedition and at the same time we ha we follow a young yeti called Tick and he lives with like the, the yetis and Ella and Tick kind of cross paths, kind of don't. This one has great commentary on sort of like the environment and I enjoyed it. I thought it was good. It just, it didn't give me that amazing middle grade feeling that I usually get. I kind of went into this expecting something totally different. I expected this really big friendship between Tick and Ella, but it kind of, that doesn't really kind of happen to like the end. No spoilers. <laughs> Once I talk about my Polathon vlog, please check that out because like I've also read so many books since this, so I've kind of forgotten a lot about it, which kind of is why it's sort of bottom of the list as well. I found this one to be largely forgettable. It was a good little story, but yeah, again, it just didn't leave me with much of an impression. So for characters, I gave it a six. For atmosphere, I gave it a seven. For writing, I gave it a seven. Plot, seven. Intrigue, six. Logic, six. And enjoyment, a seven given an at the average of 6.57. In at number 22 is Frostfire by Jamie Smith. This one has a co-pile rating of 7.14. Nothing wrong with this book either. I found it such a good read. This is like an underrated middle grade that Jade has always recommended. And I managed to pick this up during Paulathon while I was at Jade. She let me borrow her copy. And then I ended up buying myself one so I could finish it on the train journey home. This one follows Sabira and she has the honour of bonding with a Frost River. A Frost River is kind of a bit like a familiar kind of Thing. It's not technically. It kind of reminded me a bit of the demons in Philip Pullman's His Dark Material series. But people do bond with it and you will die if they sort of leave you or move on to somebody else. So when Sabira's on her way to this ceremony, there is this sort of mountain collapse and she is like sort of trapped on this mountain and it's kind of a, a survival for her. There is also this kind of group of people who are trying to infiltrate her village, so she needs to sort of save her village at the same time. Why do I keep saying sort of? And again, I found this one to be like a really good read, just like a, a bit better than average. Largely forgettable because it is a lot about her sort of surviving on this mountain. And parts of it reminded me of Pocahontas, you know, when the, um, what do they call them? When the British come to Pocahontas's home and they kind of want to infiltrate her home. Oh, okay. Ah, ah, oh, ah. Okay, Oscar's off me now and he's back on the bed, but ouch. <laughs> that was right on the dick. Again, this is another one that I read for Paulathon, so please do check out that Paulathon vlog for more thoughts on this. I'm sorry, like, this is, like, so not in depth. I'm so sorry, but, yeah, for characters, I gave a seven. For atmosphere, I gave an eight. I really enjoyed the mountain range, the kind of snowy atmosphere in this one. It was really perfect for Paulathon. It really was. Writing, I gave seven. Plot, seven. Intrigue, seven. Logic, seven. And enjoyment, seven. In at number 21 is Never Tell by Catherine Orton. This one has a co rating of 7.43, and I literally just t discussed this one with Jade last night for our middle grade monthly book club so do check out that live show I will link that up there as well and I give more thoughts on this in my Paulathon vlog yet again I'm so sorry this is a really crap wrap up I did really enjoy this book the thing we were discussing in the live show is that the plot kind of fades away by the middle of it and we mostly forgot what happened in this book we did read it you know towards the start of the month and we've read so much since then 
But this does follow a young girl who lives in a prison camp and she escapes one day but there is a sorceress in the woods and she has her shadow wolves. Yeah, like the premise sounds like so, so good. It does tailor off a little bit in the middle and there are some twists and turns I think were a little bit predictable. But overall, it was a solid read. Again, another one that's perfect for Polathon. The atmosphere in this was one of the highlights. So for my Copal rating, it was a 7 for characters, 8 for atmosphere, 8 for writing, really solidly written. There is some beautiful imagery on like moths and things in this, which we talked about in the live show because it was it was a really good discussion. Like, please tune in. If you read this book and you want to know more about it, please do tune in the live show. It was so good. Plot Game 7, Intrigue 7, Logic 7, and Enjoyment 8, which was the exact same ratings as Jade Apart From One, which I ended up changing because I wanted us to be twins. So yeah, this one has a core power rating of 7.43. In at number 20 is The Subtle Knife by Philip Pullman. This is the second book in the His Dog Material series, and this has a core power rating of 7.50. It seems low, and it definitely... It feels low to me as well because I love Northern Lights and I gave that one a much higher rating. This definitely paled in comparison to the first one. Uh, this is finally a book that I can talk about because I haven't talked about this before on one of my videos. I did buddy read this with Victoria and she really enjoyed this one and I did too. I thought it was good. I just kind of, it didn't hold my interest the entire way through and I felt that there wasn't really much of a plot. So that let it down for me. So we still follow Lyra after the events of what happens in Northern Lights. I don't want to spoil what happens at the end of Northern Lights though because it shocked me to the core. It was, oh my god. I went into this expecting a kind of a different vibe than what I got. It was a lot of sort of wandering because we have Lyra. Oh, I can't even say because it would spoil it. Okay, if you haven't read this book, please wait until I put this book down because I'm going to go into a bit of spoiler territory here. But like, spoiler starts three, two, one, now. Okay, so Lyra traverses like a different world because at the end of Northern Lights, we had the spectacular death of Roger, which opens up the worlds and Lyra can now go into a different world. And she goes into this one and she meets Will. And I really liked Will. I thought he was a really good character. Very three-dimensional. There was also a teacher character in this who I really liked as well, but her name escapes me. Yeah, it felt very isolating for a lot of this book, but it felt like it wandered off a little bit. There was a quest to grab the knife. That was a good part of this book because it gave Lyra some kind of purpose because I felt for most of this, her purpose, like, wasn't that, like, as strong as it was in the first one. But she met Will. I absolutely loved their banter. And there was so much death by the end of this book as well. Like, wow, like, it went a bit off the wall. Crazy. This is the one where I said that it could have constituted as middle grade, but I put it as YA. Mainly because this is marketed as YA in a lot of bookstores. So I have it as YA. One of only three YAs I read this month. So I'm keeping it as YA. But I think, especially with all the deaths towards the end of this, it, count, it counts for that. It was definitely darker than what I would say a middle grade was. It's definitely on the cusp, though. It's on the cusp. No, I enjoyed it. I am really looking forward to reading Amber Spyglass. I just didn't think it was as good as Northern Lights, and I don't think Amber Spyglass will be either. I really do think the series might have peaked with Northern Lights, and it's just going to be downhill from now. I also listened to this audibly as well, uh, and that was beautifully narrated, and it had beautiful, like, music at the start of every chapter. That was really nice. A really nice touch. Made this feel a bit more whimsical. For characters, I gave an 8. For atmosphere, I gave a 7. For writing, I gave a 9. For plot, I gave a 6. For intrigue, I gave 7.5. For logic, 7. And for enjoyment, an 8. Not bad at all, it just comes in at number 20. In at number 19 is Amelia Fang and the Bookworm Gang by Laura Ellen Anderson. This is a World Book Day short story set in the Amelia Fang universe. So it is tiny, it's only 59 pages long, and that's the only reason why this is like quite low on this list is because it's just so short. I would have loved this to be longer, but that kind of defeats the point of World Book Day books, so it's like nothing to do with the book really. But if you don't know what World Book Day is, it is an annual event in the UK where the goal is to get more children to read books. And every year they release books like this to get kids to read more. And it's it's amazing. And this is definitely perfect for World Book Day. Since this is the first time I'm talking about Amelia Fang, Amelia Fang does show up a lot in this, in this list. But Amelia Fang does follow a young vampire. She lives in Nocturnia where kind of creatures of the night live. So we have vampires, we have yetis, we have grim reapers. And we also have creatures of the light that live in Glitteropolis. So there's like unicorns and leprechauns and, and things like that. 
I do talk more about that series in this wrap up but this one follows Amelia and she has been given a creative writing assignment at school and she has to sort of write as block she has so much pressure on her so she is trying to come up with a really good idea but she comes across bookworms in a library but bookworms eat the books. It definitely teaches Amelia that she should stop putting so much pressure on herself and asking for help from friends as well is always a good thing so I love it for the moralistic message. Yeah the only reason it's low on the list is because it's so short. <laughs> But for characters, I gave a 9. For atmosphere, I gave 6.5. For writing, I gave a 9. For plot, I gave a 7. For intrigue, I gave a 6. For logic, 7.5. And enjoyment, I gave it an 8. So definitely check out my Amelia Fang vlog for all of my reviews for Amelia Fang. I won't be going in depth with them in this video, of course. But yeah, uh, definitely do check that out. Speaking of Amelia Fang, in at number 18 is Amelia Fang and the Half Moon Holiday by Laura Ellen Anderson. And this one has a core pile of 7.64. This is another great Amelia Fang adventure story, full length. And it's filled with beautiful illustrations by Laura Ellen Anderson. I absolutely love this series. Again, I have my full vlog and definitely check that out for more thoughts on this one. This one follows Amelia going on this scouts trip with her school, she goes with her friends and they go to Sugar Plum Island and there she gets herself into a Honey I Shrunk the Kids kind of scenario. She gets shrunk with her friends and they have to try and find a way to restore their height. It's such a fun adventure, I absolutely love it. For characters I gave us an 8, for atmosphere I gave a 7, for writing I gave a 9, for plot I gave a 7, for intrigue I gave a 7.5, for logic, I gave a 7, and for enjoyment, I gave it an 8. In at number 17 is Tilly and the Book Wanderers by Anna James. This is the first book in the Pages and Core series, and I gave this one a core rating of 7.64. I buddy read this one with Paige, and Paige absolutely loved it. I really enjoyed it as well. So this one follows Tilly, and she sort of like lives in a bookshop that is owned by her grandparents. And one day, she is visited by Anne of Green Gables, as well as Alice from Wonderland. And she starts to figure out that she can book wonder which is a special ability she is able to go into f her favorite storybooks like treasure island and of green gables alice in wonderland and honestly this is a great book if you are looking for something very nostalgic and this is an ability that I'm sure all of us would absolutely love. I would love to go into my favourite books and I love the love letter to literature, especially children's literature in this as well. This is filled with so many beautiful quotes and definitely the main selling point of this is the fact that we get to go to Alice in Wonderland, we get to go to Treasure Island and things like that. I think what this does really well is that it shows us those worlds, but I wasn't really taken by the overall plot that was not to do with her going into books, well, Tilly going into books. So I felt like outside of that, it was lacking a bit. I thought the author did a really good job at embodying the spirit of the characters, like the like Alice in Wonderland. I felt those were really well done and it felt true to the character spirit. Going forward now, I can't wait to read the second one to see how much of its own identity can carve into this overall world. I, I am excited to see more of the book wandering in future books, but I also want to make sure that the outside story is also its own, if you know what I mean. Like it's very easy to just use a plot or something from another book or another world that's already been created by somebody else. I'd love to see more of the originality in the second book, hopefully. So I am looking forward to the next one and I still really enjoyed this one. So for characters, I gave an 8. For atmosphere, I was 7. For writing, I gave an 8. Plot, 7. Intrigue, 8. Logic, 7. And enjoyment, 8.5. It was on the cusp of it being a, a potential 5 star for me, but it just kind of didn't get there. So it kind of drop quite low on this list. It's, it seems low, but it's still a really good rating. A lot of these ratings are very, you know, close close together. So not bad, not bad. In at number 16 is The Carnivorous Carnival by Lemony Snicket. This is the ninth book in the series of Unfortunate Events books and this one has a core pie rating of 7.71. That makes it the highest rated a series of Unfortunate Events book for me. I did really enjoy this one. I went on such a rant about the last book in my last wrap-up. Fortunately there was nothing that stupid in this one if you know what I mean. Like there wasn't that many inconsistencies and there wasn't that many plot holes in this one. So this is why I, I preferred it over like the last eight of them. I really like the plot of this one because the Baudelaire children are now really like deep in danger. They have been taken to this carnival unbeknownst to Count Olaf and they have to sort of disguise themselves. So I love that at this point they're kind of using the villain's tactics to sort of survive. So they're disguising themselves, they do a really good job at it. And we have got more of this world opening up in this one as well. We do meet Madame Lulu who knows more about the overall mysteries, but of course we don't find out pretty much anything. Uh, <laughs> everything goes wrong in this one. 
I absolutely love the TV show version of this book as well. I absolutely love it. It's probably my favourite episodes of the TV show. So this wasn't as good as a TV show for me, but it was still really good. One thing I do absolutely love about this one is the humour. So here we have chapter five. So for chapter five, we have uh, this page on deja vu and then you flick to the next page and it's the exact same page and it makes you feel like you're actually having deja vu because you're reading the same page that was just so humorous to me it's like a little thing really but I just I enjoy that at first I thought what, what is this a mistake but no it's that's the kind of humor you get with this kind of book so I thought that was clever so I really enjoyed this one it was quite intense towards the end as well because there's like this death that's really quite, in fact there's a couple of deaths and it's really quite brutal which is something that the series has done in the past but not quite to this extent and yeah it was a little bit hard to read at the points but the darkness of this really kind of made this one stand out for me personally and it's why it's my favourite so far. So for characters I gave an 8, atmosphere a 9 because I absolutely love the carnival setting. For writing 7, plot 8, intrigue 8, logic 6, I mean still like how can Count Olaf, who's been chasing these kids for however long now, not recognise them even though they have disguises on. It's like, surely they're not that good at being disguised, you know, but and enjoyment I gave an 8, so that comes out at 7.71. And this was the first book I read in February, just before Paulathon. And in number 15 is Amelia Fang and the Naughty Catacorns by Laura Ellen Anderson. This is the sixth book in the Amelia Fang series, and this one has a copa rating of 7.79. This one's so cute. Okay, so this is the latest installment in the series, and it definitely shows a lot of Amelia being more grown up because her mother is expecting a baby, and she is worried about being a big sister. So she is enlisted by her aunt to look after the these three catacombs so her and her friends look after them but it kind of tests her so much because they are as the title suggests very naughty so it tests her ability of being a big sister she goes through like the sort of identity crisis and for being a middle grade it's it touches so well upon such real issues partly why I absolutely love this one I do talk more about it in my Amelia fan vlog but this was definitely like less adventurous than the previous ones and it's why it's like not exactly my favorite in the series because I love me more like the fantasy side of it but this one made me shed a tear at the end. It's so heartfelt, so heartwarming. And by this point in this series, you absolutely love these characters. So it's it's perfect for that. For characters, I gave a 9. For atmosphere, I gave a 7. For writing, I gave a 9. For plot, I gave a 7. For intrigue, I gave a 6.5. For logic, I gave an 8. And for enjoyment, I gave an 8. So that gives it that 7.79. And in number 14 is A Court of Thorns and Roses by Sarah J Maas. This is the first book in the Court of Thorns and Roses series. And this has a co rating of 7.792. Again, I did a whole vlog dedicated to this. So I will link that one so you know more about my thoughts. So this does follow Feyre and she accidentally kills a magical fae. And she is punished by having to live in this fae kingdom. And it's a Beauty and the Beast retelling. And that made me scared to read it because I'm not the biggest fan of Beauty and the Beast retellings because I feel like they've been done to death and I haven't really liked a lot of the other ones I've read. But this one really surprised me. I really enjoyed this one. I buddy read this with Becca at Becca and the Books and Ashley at A Frog Through Fiction. We did this for Brit's 24 hour readathon and I just had so many thoughts on this one. Again, I will link that vlog. I had such a good time reading this. I know a lot of people don't like Sarah J Mass's writing style, but I think it's so accessible and it's so easy to read, so easy going. I flew through this. Well, I tried to. Ashley and Becca were so distracting while trying to read this. But I did really enjoy reading about these characters. I thought they were so like well-developed even for being a first book, like they had their own identities. I'm so excited to see where this goes because I know a lot of people love Akamath, which is the next book. And I'm especially excited for all the dirty stuff that's about to happen in the second one. <laughs> Not that much dirty stuff happens in this one, but you know, just enough, I guess, to get by. And I didn't really want to rate this one too highly anyway, because I do think that I will love the later ones a lot more than this one, because it didn't exactly blow me away, but I thought it was better than a lot of people have been given a credit for, personally. For characters, I gave an eight. For atmosphere, I gave an eight. For writing, I gave an eight. For plot, I gave a seven. For intrigue, I gave an eight. For logic, I gave a seven. And for enjoyment, I gave an 8.5, giving it that 7.79. And number 13 is Winter House by Ben Goodison. This is the first book in the Winter House series. And this has a copy rating of 7.86. I read this one again for Paulathon. More thoughts on that in the Paulathon blog. But this one does follow a young girl who gets sent to live at the Winter House Hotel. There is these mysteries going on at Winter House Hotel because not everything is as it seems. There are some people who are staying at the Winter House Hotel who seem a little bit sketchy. So it's kind of up to... What's her name again? 
So it's kind of up to Elizabeth to kind of figure out what's going on. She meets a boy called Freddy there and they kind of help each other because they're, they're both really smart. They are both so well matched. I absolutely love their chemistry together. Every chapter starts with a sort of a word game. So there's a random one there for chapter 11. Like that's kind of word game that they play and it really does help them with like their sort of mystery solving skills. This one has kind of kickstarted my addiction to middle grade mysteries now. So I read Hide and Fathom Thief last month and I loved that. And then when I read this one, I was like, okay, this has solidified my idea that I am really loving middle grade mysteries at the minute. So really excited that I love this one and I have the second one ready to read whenever I can fit that into a TBR. But definitely thank you Lexi for the recommendation. I saw this on Lexi's channel and thank you so much Kristen for gifting me this book. I, I really enjoyed it. It was such a nice surprise to absolutely I think adore this. I really adore this. For characters, I gave this one a seven. I did enjoy the characters and I like their chemistry together, but Elizabeth wasn't exactly a standout protagonist, especially when I talk about different protagonists during the week of Polathon. There were, I think all the books I read during Polathon had female protagonists. And out of those, Elizabeth probably comes sort of bottom in my ranking of those protagonists. Um, so I gave characters a seven. Atmosphere an eight because I love the Winter House setting. I loved how cozy and like chilly it was you know it was it was really good writing I gave an eight plot an eight intrigue eight I was intrigued by the mystery logic eight and enjoyment an eight so it was definitely above standard really enjoyed it yeah I can't wait to read the sequel now number 12 is Amelia Fang and the Memory Thief by Laura Ellen Anderson and this one has a copa rating of 7.93 this one's the third book in the Amelia Fang series and this one is about the town of Nocturnia starting to lose their memory and Amelia seems to be one of the only two people who is losing their memory and she has to sort of figure out why that's happening so this is like another really good mystery I mean I kind of had assumptions of like how this was happening and I love how this tied in with the first two books because there was this big conspiracy thing happening in the first two and this one kind of carries over some of those elements and I really enjoyed my time reading this. I absolutely love reading all of the Amelia Fang books especially with the illustrations. Honestly I can't rave about these illustrations enough but again I talk about this loads in my Amelia Fang blog. So my core pile for this is characters in eight. This is still really early days with the Amelia Fang books and my character ratings for the later Amelia Fang books goes up because I've started to fall in love with these characters so I gave it an 8 for this one. Uh, atmosphere an 8, writing 9, plot 7.5, intrigue 8, logic 7 and enjoyment an 8. And at number 11 is Rose Madder by Stephen King which has a copa rating of 8.07. This is such an underrated Stephen King book. Like I'm so glad Bobby recommended this one and Bobby gifted me this one as well but I also buddy read this with Steph, Bobby, Cody and Monica and I had such a blast buddy reading it with them. They had so many great ideas about it and we had really good discussions about it as well. I mean they discussed most of it. I was so super behind reading this. I am terrible at buddy reads. I'm sorry. But this one follows Rose and she escapes from her abusive husband of so many years, I forgot how many years they're married, but she has been going through abuse for a very long time. And one day she decides she enough is enough, she takes his credit card and she escapes. She goes to a totally different town and she thinks she's safe for a while, but her husband is a police officer and he is very obsessive. He's he's a terrible, terrible character, but really well written. I loved hating him. He's like so fleshed out, he felt very real and I think that's what made this all the more scary. It's just how real the situation is. And I felt really scared for Rosie because you also get things in Norman's point of view, who is Rosie's husband. And he is so smart because he's a police officer, he can think about like where she's gone. He can analyze things, he tries to put himself in her shoes and he's very good at doing that. It is so scary. I was anticipating what was going to happen, but I had no idea what would happen. Because also at the same time, Rosie discovers this painting that she can go into. And there is a sort of another version of Rosie in this painting. And that was really intriguing for me. I absolutely loved the sort of supernatural twist to it and all the stuff that it implied. This has like a lot of metaphor in it, which it's hit and miss for me metaphors because I didn't like the style of sea and that was filled to the brim with metaphors. This one had metaphors, but it was more subtle. It felt more relevant. It was scary in the realest way possible. Not my favorite Stephen King so far. I think my favorite is still either Misery or Pet Cemetery because I love those ones. But this one, again, underrated. It's one of my favorite Stephen Kings. Thank you so much, Bobby, for recommending this one. It, it was such a revelation, such a revelation. So for characters, I gave an eight. 
for Amnesty I gave a 7.5, mainly because for a lot of this book, Stephen King does waffle on. <laughs> uh, so I kind of brought the atmosphere down a bit, I kind of lost the tension a little bit. Yeah, so that's why I gave it a little bit of a lower rating for that. Right now I gave a 9, like I can't fault Stephen King's writing a lot of the time. He does repeat himself a lot though, he does have the same kind of way of describing breasts and like there's just, uh, I think it's not exactly unnecessary because I'm sure it does like fit in with Stephen King's mind but I don't know, but for some of it, it did feel really unnecessary to me. Plot, I gave an 8. For Intrigue, I gave a 7. I was really intrigued by the painting and things like that, but again, because of the lull in the story, and especially in the middle, I lost Intrigue a little bit, so it didn't hold my attention all the way through, so that went down a bit. Logic, I gave a 9, because the way Norman tries to find Rosie is so logical. And Enjoyment, I gave an 8. Definitely took a warnings for a lot of things. Like, this is one way I don't think you can like enjoy enjoy because the subject matter is so dark and so real but I think for Stephen King's writing this is one that I did enjoy reading about it felt very real finally we are in the top 10 and this is another one I read for Polathon and in at number 10 is The Polar Bear Explorers Club by Alex Bell and this one has a core pile of 8.14 this one follows Stella and she looks up to her uncle who has sort of adopted her as his like, daughter but he is an explorer and he is part of the Polar Bear Explorers Club and Stella wants more than anything to join this explorers club. But the only thing is, girls aren't allowed to join. So her uncle fights to try and get her to be part of it. That's where the adventure sort of begins. Does she get into it? Does she not? There is this expedition and it's this is the perfect book for Paulathon. The perfect book. I absolutely love reading this one. This is the first in a series as well, so I thought this started off really strong. I absolutely love Stella as a character. She is so determined, and she's definitely one of the best protagonists I've read in a middle grade. I love her relationship with her uncle. It felt so real. I love the plot of this as well. Like, I love the expedition element of it. I love anything to do with a journey or this kind of adventure element, and this is just perfect to the core. And it's definitely a really good starting point for a series. I cannot wait to read books two and three. Again, I speak more about this in my Polathon vlog, so getting into my core pile ratings, I gave characters an eight, atmosphere an eight, writing a nine, plot an eight, intrigue an eight, logic a seven, and enjoyment a nine. I loved reading this so, so much. And in number nine is Amelia Fang and the Barbaric Ball by Laura Ellen Anderson, which has a core pile rating of 8.21. And as the start of the Amelia Fang series, I absolutely loved this. I fell in love with the world and the characters straight away. I was just pulled in again by the illustrations. It's, it really helped so much with falling in love with the story. In this one, Amelia Fang's parents are hosting a barbaric ball and this year the king and the prince are coming along to it. The prince is one of Amelia Fang's new schoolmates and they do not get on very well. This prince is a spoiled brat. And what I love about this though is the character development, man. Knowing now, like from this book to the sixth book, the, the growth of these characters is phenomenal. Absolutely amazing. For it being a middle grade as well, like this is like the younger end of the middle grade, this still dealt with so many social issues. It teaches kids the best lessons and <laughs> this is just so cute and fluffy but also so gothic because it's set in Nocturnia and Nocturnia is filled with these creatures of the night, you know, and it's just, it's perfect. This is like, the, I mentioned this in my vlog but it's Nightmare Before Christmas meets the Adams Family. Yeah, and that's like how I would describe this one and with a little bit of Mourn of the Vampire like thrown in there as well. But for my core power ratings, I gave characters an 8, atmosphere an 8.5, for writing a 9, plot 7.5, intrigue 8, logic 7.5, and enjoyment 9. And in number 8 is Brightstorm by Vashti Hardy with a core power rating of 8.29. I think making this one of my top 20 middle grades of all time. And also today, March the 1st, as recording this, it is exactly two years since this book came out, so happy anniversary. <laughs> so this one follows twins Arthur and Maudie. I think it's pronounced Maudie. They are given news that their explorer father has died on an expedition but they don't think they've been told the entire truth. So they go on this sort of mystery adventure to find out what's happened and it's just dripping with adventure and oh my gosh you will fall in love with this writing style as well. You will also fall in love with the characters. I absolutely love following these characters. Their relationship as well being twins is phenomenal. What middle grade does so well as well is sibling relationships. And you will 
you will see their ups and downs, like how they butt heads a lot, but they also come together. They work so well together as well. I mentioned this in a review on Goodreads that this felt like Treasure Island if it was set in the sky, but not set in space because that's Treasure Planet. <laughs> yeah, there was so many adventurous moments in this, and I listened to the audiobook as well, and that really added to this, like especially the atmosphere, because a lot of the time there was this like music that felt very Indiana Jones-esque. So there was, like, it just felt so adventurous like this one if you want a really adventurous book this one is perfect for it i now cannot wait to read dark whispers which is the next book in the bright storm adventure series so it's one of the reasons why i've given this such a high reign especially for writing i just thought it was perfect and definitely a perfect start i think this was vashti hardy's debut so for that reason alone it's just incredible and so impressive very steampunk 100% would recommend and it's definitely perfect for a few prompts for believe a 2 which is coming very soon I can't wait to announce it but for my Copa ratings I gave characters an 8, atmosphere an 8, for writing I gave it 10 I thought it was perfectly written Plot 8, Intrigue 8, Logic 8, Enjoyment 8. And oh, I just, I know that it's just going to get better from here. So I have Dark Whispers and Wild Spark literally ready to go. <laughs> and number 7 is Heartstopper Volume 3 by Alice Osman. And this one has a Copa rating of 8.43. And that is the highest rating of a Heartstopper Volume so far. These volumes just keep getting better and better and better. I absolutely love Nick and Charlie. They are my couple goals. They are my inspiration. It's so easy to get into because it's just so immersive. I absolutely love the art style of this. And it's just like the plot wise as well. This one's definitely the best one so far because Nick and Charlie go to Paris on a school trip. And of course that's like the city of love. But of course they have their struggles. There are some really topical issues in this that I think is dealt with very, very well. And I cannot wait to see where we go from here because I'm really interested to see more character growth from Nick and Charlie. Not only just Nick and Charlie, but I love some of the other characters as well. The teachers were surprisingly standouts in this one as well. Like, oh, yeah, I, I don't want to spoil anything, but keep an eye out for the teachers who come on this trip as well. They are not only funny, but just, just so wonderful. I absolutely love it. This makes my little gay heart so happy. And as you guys know as well, I don't like a lot of romance either. Usually it makes me feel sick, but I don't know why, but Nick and Charlie just, it's so sweet. And I think this would make like any romance hater fall in love with them. I really do. And I cannot wait. You know, I think this will be a much higher rating for me if it was like a novel format, because as I said, graphic novels are really my thing. But I know there is, a, I think a novella coming called Called Nick and Charlie and I will leave a link for that or I will give the information on the screen for that one. I am so excited for that one. I cannot wait. I really need to read my two favourite gay boys in novel form. So for my Copa Reigns I gave the characters a 10 out of 10. Honestly I've never met characters I've fallen in love with more. Atmosphere I gave a 7, for writing I gave an 8, for plot an 8, intrigue 7, logic 9, and enjoyment a 10. And in number 6 is Amelia Fang and the Unicorn Lords by Laura Ellen Anderson. This is the second book in the Amelia Fang series, and this has a core pile rating of 8.57. Oh, I love this one. This was better than the first one. It continues on from the mystery of the first one, and it just developed so much, and it had me quite surprised by the end of it. I wasn't expecting some of the things that happened in this. And again, I talk about this in my vlog. So I will just go through my average ratings. So for characters, I gave an 8. For atmosphere, 8.5. For writing, I gave a 9. For plot, I gave 8.5. For intrigue, I gave a 9. I was so intrigued by what was happening. And to be introduced to Glitteropolis, like this entire new world. Logic, I gave an 8. For enjoyment, I gave a 9, which gave it the 8.57. And because I couldn't actually really decide which one I loved the most, I still placed this one higher because this also got an 8.57 core power rating. But in at number five is Amelia Fang and the Lost Yeti Treasures, which I think is my favorite in the Amelia Fang series. This is the fifth book in Laura Ellen Anderson's series. As I said, 8.57, so it's like a tied number five with the Unicorn Lords. But this one, it, the atmosphere I think really got me because it's set in the mountain area. And this one is about Amelia Fang's friend Florence, who is a Yeti, and it's her grand Yeti's birthday. So they're celebrating that in the mountains, but there is this kind of collapse of the mountain and it traps Amelia Fang and her friends inside and they had to sort of try and get out but also kind of discover where all of these missing things are going because somebody was stealing some stuff from people. It, it's this big mystery which is one of the things I love the series most for. I think this one's my favourite one. For characters I gave a 9 because at this point I do absolutely love these characters. Atmosphere 9, writing 9, plot 8, 
Intrigue 8, Logic 8, and Enjoyment 9. And in number 4 is Orphans of the Tide by Stuart Murray with a Copa rating of 8.64. I was shocked to the core by this book. I, oh my gosh. So, right. It is set on the last city on Earth. Everywhere else has been drowned out by the enemy. The enemy comes back every now and then where they use a vessel. So a vessel is like a sort of innocent person who like lives in the city, they appear to them, and yeah, like I'm not gonna explain anything more about that. But we do follow Ellie, and she saves this boy who is cut open from a whale from the very first chapter, and everybody thinks this boy is the enemy. So she has to save him. At the same time, we have diary entries from the real vessel, and it really adds this incredibly well-written gothic atmosphere to this. It really is one of the best written children's books I've read. It's so vividly detailed. Again, there is this twist that had me shocked to my absolute core. It was brilliant. And I really can't compare this book to anything else because it's like so original. It's such a weird plot but it's one that I kind of really want to see more of. So if anybody has read this and knows any kind of books that would be similar to it, please let me know because I want to read more. And this is Stuart Murray's debut. It's only just come out, so I'm going to have to wait ages for his next book now, aren't I? So for my Copa ratings, I gave characters an 8, atmosphere a 9. I absolutely loved the setting of this city. It was so gothic. For writing, I gave it a 10. This definitely was such a well-written debut. Oh. Plot I gave an 8.5 for Intrigue 8, Logic 8, and Enjoyment a 9. I really want the next book now. I don't know if there's going to be more in this series. I don't think there will be, but I'm looking forward to seeing more from this author. And in number 3 is The 13 Treasures by Michelle Harrison. This one has a Copa rating of 8.86. This one is the first book in the 13 Treasures series. This came out gosh, 11 years ago now, and it's taken me so long to read, and I don't know why, but I absolutely love these covers, by the way, because I absolutely love Michelle Harrison. She is literally one of my favourite children's authors of all time. This one follows a young girl called Tanya, and she has second sight. She is able to see sort of like fairy tale creatures, so like fairies, but fairies are not how they appear. They are tricksters. This one's filled with goblins and witches and grim fairy tale kind of creatures with like the original intent of them. So like fairies are tricksters. There are changelings goblins speak in rhyme. So this is very grim-esque and one of the things Michelle Harrison does the best is her atmosphere. She knows how to write fantastic atmosphere and I really enjoyed following Tanya as well. She is a very capable protagonist. She is quite smart. She is able to adapt to a lot of the things that go on around her as well. I mean, to be fair, at the start, the fairies get her kicked out of her home, so she has to live at Elveston Manor, where um, her grandmother lives, and it's such a great manor as well. I absolutely love the atmosphere of that as well. There is also this mystery of a girl who went missing 50 years ago, and I just absolutely love it. I, again, I love my mysteries. They are just so engrossing, and this one is done so, so well. Of course it's done so well. It's Michelle Harrison. What am I talking about? If you're looking for something a bit whimsical but very grounded in fairy tale origin, then this is such a good one to read. For characters I gave an 8, for atmosphere I gave a 9, for writing I gave a 10, for plot I gave a 9, for intrigue I gave a 9, for logic I gave an 8, and for enjoyment I gave a 9. It's such a great start to a series that I should have read years ago. <laughs> and in number 2 is the 13 Curses by Michelle Harrison, the second book in the 13 Treasure series. And this one has a Copa rating of 8.93. And this one is better than the first one. It, like, it edges it out for me. We are introduced to a character called Red in this one, who I absolutely love. She is so strong and she surprised me a lot. Like the decision she makes, I was sat there reading this like, oh my gosh, she actually made that decision. And what's great about this is that I think there will be like consequences to a lot of her actions and it just, it, again, it feels so real. It's so well written. The Hedge Witch in this as well is a, a villain and oh my god, like a great, great villain at that. And there's a scene where, I'm not going to spoil anything, but there's a scene where this Hedge Witch kind of transforms into her past victims. It's so chilling and there are a lot of chilling moments in this. It still continues on with that fairy tale creature Thing going on, like very grim-esque. We are also introduced more to the world, there is a fairy court. It's just, it's so immersive, like by this point as well, the books are getting bigger, which I absolutely love. We get to go through the fairy realm, we have such vividly detailed landscapes, and this, oh, it's just fantastic. And when you read more about like Red's backstory, you will absolutely, I think you will fall in love with her too. She is definitely one of the best protagonists I've read. I think I prefer Red over Tanya. Oh, she does things, and she is just, I'm just there for her. I'm like, yes, girl, get it, you know? So 
Uh, I absolutely adored this one. For characters, I gave an 8.5. For atmosphere, I gave a 9. For writing, I gave a 10. For plot, I gave a 9. Intrigue, 9. Logic, 8. And enjoyment, a 9. What more can I say about it? Which leaves my number one book, which for February was The Eye of the North by Sinead O'Hart. And this one has a copa rating of 9 on the dot, 9.00. I read this one for Polathon. Again, more thoughts in my Polathon vlog. I mean, firstly, let me just read the beginning line. Also, thank you, Jade, for gifting me this. Let me just tell you the opening line of this, because it just gets you, and you know from this that you're just gonna love this book. But it goes, For as long as she could remember, Emmeline Widget had been sure her parents were trying to kill her. Oh, And just from then on, I just knew I was on this epic ride. So I read this at Jade's and it was just, it was so much fun reading it. And this is one of Jade's favourite middle grade books actually, and with good reason. So this does follow Emmeline. She gets a telegram that she is now an orphan. I absolutely love the way that Emmeline responds to being an orphan as well, because obviously so many children in children's books are orphans. I love Emmeline's reaction to it. She's like, an orphan? How unfashionable. You know, it's just like, ugh. Girl, you are so self-aware. <laughs> but her parents were on an expedition, but the note that her parents leave Emmeline is very ominous. She has to flee her home. There are people after Emmeline, especially Dr. Siegfried Bohr, who is the main antagonist of this book. I probably pronounced his name wrong, but he is trying to awaken the Kraken in the far north because he wants immortality. And it's like this epic adventure. A lot of it's seafaring. So the atmosphere in this is very great, very polar-esque by the time we get to the north. I absolutely loved the the character of Thing as well. He's a young boy who Emily meets on this on the on the ship, and oh my god, his backstory will break your heart. And I, that's one of the things I love about this book is the character development is so well done. Again, I talk a lot about this in my Polathon vlog, so I'll leave that link in there. But this was my favourite book of the month. I absolutely love it. One of my favourite middle grades of all time now. So for characters, I gave a 9. For atmosphere, a 9. Writing, 10. Plot, 9. Intrigue, 8. Logic, 8. And enjoyment, a 10. And with that comes the end of this wrap up and I am exhausted. I am never doing that many books in one month ever again. If I do, I'm gonna have to do like mid month wrap ups or something. But I hope you enjoyed it. Please let me know how your February went. Let me know if you read any of these books, if you agree, disagree on these books. I'm all for discussing it. <laughs> yeah, that's the end of my video. Please leave a little like if you enjoyed and subscribe if you haven't already. Please leave a little comment, let me know you're here. And thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. So I will see you in the next video. Bye. I am absolutely knackered.